Before we start, um, I would like to acknowledge that all of us here are located somewhere on Aboriginal land across this vast place now called New South Wales. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and future. Um, my name is Beck Dean. I am a manager in arts funding and development at Create New South Wales. And there are two of uh, my colleagues here with me sort of managing things behind the scenes, um, Merrily Ray and Ivana Jovanovic. Um, and they are um, in the background uh, and they'll be helping us uh, with um, moderating comments and finding them um, in the chat box. Um, everybody else should have their cameras off and their microphones off um, so we don't choke up uh, the system. So I'm joined by three guests this morning and we're going to be wrangling with some of the possibilities and challenging uh, aspects of taking arts programming into the digital realm and the kinds of questions that artists and organisations might want to ask themselves before undertaking this and going down this path. Um, so with me today, I'll ask you guys to wave so you can um, show people who you are, is uh, Jackie Bailey. Um, Jackie is the founder and principal uh, of BYP Group. Um, she's a researcher, evaluator and policy advisor with 18 years experience in government and non-profit sectors and also is a bit of an artist herself as well. Um, also does creative writing practice on top of these things. Oh yeah, a little, but um, it's great to have uh, perspectives from both sides, I think. Um, Lizzie Muller um, is a first year professor. She's a curator and researcher specialising in audience experience and interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, she researches the relationship between curating and changing disciplinary structures and the future of museums, among a range of other things. And Keir Winesmith, he is a strategic consultant and academic working at the intersection of digital and culture. He advises museums, galleries, libraries, archives and universities on digital transformation initiatives and the development of new digital experiences among many other things. Um, I encourage you to look all these guys up because their CVs are like, Whoa. okay. So um, we're going to um, conduct this first episode quite gently and conversationally. Um, for those of you joining us, we'd like to invite you to put questions into this chat window and I will moderate them. And um, hopefully uh, Lizzie and Keir and Jackie will also see those messages and be quite responsive to the things that you're saying. Um, so I'd like Jackie firstly to kick off um, and talk with us a bit about the work that she's doing with various arts organisations around understanding firstly, I guess this is doing some groundwork before you sort of leap into these um, uh, other sorts of areas of digital programming or increase your capacity, but to actually look at what you mean to people um, and what your value is to your audiences. Can you talk us through some of that work you're doing, Jackie? Sure, thanks for that, Beck. Um, and hi, everybody. And I just want to quickly acknowledge that I live and work right now on the unceded lands of the Wadi Wadi people of the Darawal Nation. Um, so in terms of public value, I've just been rabbiting on about this for years, really, I think. And then just recently with everything that's been going on, it just kind of occurred to me again, even more strongly that people are getting very, um, you know, trying to do trying to do their best and trying to be very generous and also kind of responding in a bit of a panic way as well in terms of putting things up online. Um, and so for me, it's about helping organisations just take that step back, you know, take a breath, take a step back and have a think before having to put things up online, just have a think about what their, what their value is, uh, what they value, I suppose, you know, what their values are, and then to ensure that in this period where people are online rather than in person to use that period to reinforce your value with your public um, so rather than try and be making money out of what you put up online you know that's a longer term kind of idea 
um, and trying to come up with sophisticated digital content strategies, just really think about what your value is and kind of just distill that into what it is you do online. So that's a bit motherhoody, but that's that's kind of the principle of it. So yeah, I'm happy to talk through. It's it's easier to understand with specific examples. Um, so mm. if somebody in the in the group has an example they want to give me and we can talk it through, I don't really want to talk you through the companies that I've been doing that with because, you know, that's their own kind of confidential stuff. But that's generally the kind of conversation that we're having. You know, what is it? How can you make sure that after this the public sentiment is still with you? Yeah. So one of the things that um, I was interested to sort of read over the weekend is people starting to have develop opinions about, um, I guess, artists and organisations quickly sort of doing exactly what they or trying to do exactly what they do uh, in in real space and transfer it to the digital. So, for instance, um, exhibition walkthroughs uh, and things that kind of engage uh, in a very kind of uh, uh, not. Not to, I'm not making a judgment uh, about the superficiality, but but applying sort of a video kind of lens to what otherwise would be a very um, experiential kind of uh, uh, and material kind of experience. Um, I guess so. That's that's a question. Is like I'm I'm running a gallery uh, that focuses on um, uh, material uh, or a textiles practice or uh, painting. How do I go about engaging um, audiences now that I can't open my doors, I guess, would be a question. Uh, do you want me to respond to that or do you want Lizzie? Yeah, I think uh, I think it's a question. I, I think I'm just kind of interested in how you then get to work with organisations maybe to overcome or to think about those challenges. What kinds of questions you're asking them, I guess, Jackie? Okay. Yeah, no worries. So in that if you know if, if, a, if I was talking to a gallery like you described um, I would just take a step back and remember you know what why do people come to your gallery anyway it's it's a lot of the time the research shows it's not actually to do with the textiles or whatever it is that you specialize in it's to do with the like you said the in-person live experience that they're that they're trying to have and it's about a social connection um, so just remember why people come to you anyway before you try and attempt to replicate that online because you, if you're trying to give people those feelings that they get from coming to your gallery, so we talk a lot about the intrinsic experience of the arts, um, then just putting your stuff online is, is not going to do that. That's not why people come to you. There might be educational reasons that they come and you can look at educational stuff. Um, there might be artistic development reasons that they come, you can look at that, but for the general punter who walks, who goes to a gallery, it's generally not those things. It's, it's, it's much more about the connection and the engagement. So you get to that in a digital space in a different way. You get to that by using the personal connection online. So, you know, you get your artists um, who might, who you might typically profile in your, you know, in your gallery. Um, instead of just putting their work up online, you might get, you might encourage them or help them to do little, you know, short videos that they then share online. Maybe they do little art explorations or things that that they love because, again, you're just trying to get at the personal connection. And at the end of these few months, you want people to love you. You want people to still be fond of you so that they come back and also so that you keep being supported. Uh, what what kinds of, um, Jackie, what kinds of uh, tasks or processes would you give to an organisation to get them to take that step back and to get mm. them thinking in those ways? Well, I mean, pr the primary thing that seems to work is just to kind of change the conversation from, oh, what should we be doing online? Like freak out, freak out, panic, panic because we're all there, right? <laughs> and we need to change, just take a breath and the main, and slip back into artist mode, you know, the creative mode, mm -hmm. which is a really hard space to access when you're in anxiety, crazy mode. Um, we all know that. So you have to kind of get back into that space and, and know that when, you'll know when you're doing it right, when, you're, when you are actually extracting some joy from the experience again of creating this stuff that you're 
that you're putting on online. Um, it's not just an exercise of, it's not about marketing. You know what I mean? It's, um, it's about connection. That's what the arts is about. It's about relationship and connection and being and embodiment and all that sort of stuff. So reminding yourself of all those beautiful words and putting yourself back in your practice and why you exist in the first place and then opening up your mind to what that, how you, how you communicate that experience and how you give that experience and share that experience with people over the internet. And it's not necessarily going to be, well, it won't be in the ways that you've done it before necessarily. Um, so that's the main question. I guess it's not really so much a question as a, you know, just take a deep breath kind of thing is what is the main thing that we do to begin with. And then remember that you're an artist and, and, you know, play to that strength, go to that mm. place of um of connection and and what does that look like in times like this and so there's a comment here from lisa cahill from the australian design center is saying that's exactly what we're doing we've reaffirmed for ourselves that we're actually quite good at our online connections so we're valuing that part of what we do um yeah so i i think it's for, for organizations that i guess are well attuned to sort of um bringing that strategy into the online uh, context. For others, it might be that your website is basically a landing page for people to find out where you are. And so the digital space might be actually quite a leap, even though we are in the 21st century, we still do a lot of things in very analog ways. Um, and so I guess I might now um, introduce um, Kia and Lizzie to talk about Data Salon, which is um, an event that you've been hosting for some time, which engages with uh, practitioners in the digital space and what they are um, creating and presenting and how they're doing that. Can you talk us through Data Salon and particularly the next um, event that you're hosting? Data Salon is a kind of bi-monthly meetup that we've been running for a year now. This is actually our sixth Data sal I, I can't say data, it's our data salon, our sixth data salon, um, which um, we've been running it as part of the Sydney Culture Network, which many people who are probably online now are part of. So that's a, um, a group of people in Sydney working for major cultural organisations and minor ones, actually, in fact, all of the cultural organisations coming together to try and build capacity within the sector. And the data salon has been a bi-monthly way to talk specifically about cultural data and um, to help people share experiences and also to see where there are commonalities and where we might be stronger working together than working individually, which in the world of cultural data, there's a lot of room for collaboration and for building capacity in collaborative ways. So that's what the Data Salon is in general. Keir, do you want to talk about the one that's coming up, our first online Data Salon? Yeah, sure. I actually just posted the link to um, RSVP if you're interested. So this Friday in the afternoon, it's uh, shifted to accommodate um, Anzac Day and, and the su supposed school holidays. This one, we're going to be looking at how different institutions in Australia and abroad have been effectively responding to this moment, um, doing, as Jackie points out, sort of values-based work, uh, effective values-based work, but also create a forum where people can, as they have been all the other data salons, um, find adjacencies between their practice and their peers and colleagues' practice to make like little subgroups that go up and work on uh, different things that could lead to you know, genuine collaboration. So it's a little bit different to some of the other salons we've run in the past where you know we have a 20 minute or 30 minute presentation that's on a topic that's very sort of germane to data and the cultural space. And then we have almost like a 45 to 50 minute discussion, facilitated discussion by Lizzie and I, and then a moment for sort of group networking at the end. Um, this will be a little bit more free form as um, the sort of structures of physical space are different from the structures of say Zoom or GoToMeeting or all of their peers. And so we'll be working out with the audience what's the most effective way to support um, cultural organizations who are using data, hopefully in effective ways, uh, in this moment and going forward. I think for all of us in um, Data Salon, we've been meeting up, like I said, for a year now, 
And I think there's this sudden feeling for this one that suddenly this group of workers who've been meeting together to talk about cultural data and how they do their work are suddenly right at the front line of this crisis. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden the work we've been doing building capacity in the sector over a year, I think is actually about to come to fruition because this group has a sense of cohesion together and also a sense of being there, you know, to kind of support one another. But I think none of them have ever had two months like this two months. So I'm kind mm -hmm. of expecting that this iteration of data salon will be kind of a bit of a departure for us all as we suddenly go for it's like real action stations now for the people who are working with digital culture across all of these organizations. And I guess obviously with that, there are organisations that have been very well equipped over the years to deliver on digital programs or to be thinking about and researching and, and sort of looking at, I guess, where they're positioned in terms of being able to deliver these things. Um, and they're in much better, or they're able to almost, um, I noticed that I think um, the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra um, was uh, about to um, present, uh, I think, uh, a, a new program the day of um, the lockdown, and the day that all of those um, events were cancelled, and they were able, able to present that concert that evening online, because they, yeah. they'd already sort of working up towards this moment, but, um, you know, obviously this COVID-19 and the restrictions and the public health orders have sort of pushed that forward and pushed those timeframes forward. And I think similarly with um, uh, the Sydney Opera House, we're going to be hearing from them, but they also had a, a range of programs that, that, that were in development that are now pushed forward. And um, yeah, so it's, it's kind of interesting to see how um, those programs have, have been kind of instant, instantly very successful but there's, I guess there's a, there's a kind of sliding scale of, of organisational capability. Um, so I guess mm. it'd be great to hear from all of you, I guess, about what you feel like as, as people who are, um, are looking at this, uh, this kind of cultural production, what kinds of um, programmes you feel like are cutting through this kind of already packed space of the, the internet and, and online production? Mm. Well, uh, I think um, you your go? point about. <clears throat> oh, go on. No, I've got a few examples, but I think if you make the strategic point, then I can do the tactical one. <laughs> okay, so what? So I'm strategic. You're tactical. Just to be clear. Okay, so <laughs> um, I just. <laughs> I guess I just wanted to come back to that point you raised there, Beck, about people being at different stages in their digital journey, because I think that's really important. And as you said, there are lots of organisations, cultural organisations out there who already had huge digital capacity, who had already invested in that. For some of them, I feel like they might think um, it feels a little bit like the future's come forward, you know, things they were planning to do maybe in a staged way over the next year or even five years has come forward fast. I think that's true for a lot of us. Um, but I think it's really important to think about those organizations who have less digital capacity already, because there's still an enormous amount that those groups can do. And I absolutely love Jackie's point that you start with values, you start with who you are. Um, but I think you also need to start with resources. So what do you actually have available to you? So if you're, you know, the state library, you have already digitized an enormous amount of material, same with people like the Getty, with the art gallery, all of these big organizations with collections already have huge digital assets that they can deploy. Lots of them already have quite sophisticated means for people to interface with those digital assets. Some people are gonna have very few digital assets but they're going to have other things that they can really work with. And I just, I'm, I don't know if I'm straying into tactical territory by using an example, but um, I wanted to just bring up the example of Kasula because they're going to be speaking at the data salon at the end of the week. And I've just really enjoyed looking at their digital program because they really have used the assets that they have, which include, you know, a restaurant, which include a garden, which include a really vibrant program of children's activities. And their digital offering is not complicated, although they've actually got some really awesome, quite complicated stuff, some 3D walkthroughs as well. Um, but they've really worked with the resources that they have. And I think that's a really important 
thing to start with. Like, what have you actually got that people want to stay connected with? And people probably do love their garden, love their kitchen. And as Jackie was saying, a lot of this is about keeping people connected to what they love about you already. So I think resources mm -hmm. is a really key thing to think about. Kia. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, you go, Kia. Yeah, I think that's a really good example. There's, uh, I spent a lot of time living and working in the United States. Um, and so I'm just going to throw my uh, alma mater in the chat. This organization, SF Mama, has a has a sort of 35 year history of interviewing artists. So it's the first museum in the world to put artist interviews on the internet. And so when um, when sort of COVID hit, uh, some things that we'd built during my tenure were really easy to deploy. And so there was already a kind of banner, which was like the alert banner for when something you know outrageous was going to happen, like we called the apocalypse mode. So that could just be turned on. Like no one didn't to do any work. You just simply click the button, wrote COVID-19 and said, we're going to be closed on Friday. Then below that, in the past, there would be a, a kind of a brochure, please come and visit the institution. But instead of that, you can see if you go to that URL or another good example is the Philbrook, which is a much smaller institution, did exactly the same thing, which is they just took the kind of best, most usable content for a broad audience, broke it down into chunks, and then instead of having a home page, just bounce people to this content page that just simply said, you cannot visit us. We would love you to come. You cannot visit us. But here's something for teachers. Here's something for students. Here's something for artists. Here's something for the interested. And then here's kind of like a, a blog maybe from our director about why we've done what we've done. So it's, it's quite simple. It didn't take a lot of work. For those institutions, they have really strong digital capacity. And so they're able to do it really quickly, like within the day. But for most institutions, mm -hmm. simply saying, we're here, we love you, we're alive, we still have these values, we're still trying to reach these audiences with things that ma matter to them, and here's just enough for you so that you can know that we're alive and we're doing well, so that you create a kind of uh, an umbrella under which you can do the hard work of change, the hard work of planning, the hard work of strategy. The other thing that's sort of really noticeable to me is, so I'm going to post another thing in the list, is I'm on the board of a professional development organisation that has been working at the I guess the cold place of uh, digital in museums since uh, the 70s. So it's been around 50 plus years now. And I've been on the board and, and the kind of leading the strategic direction of that organization. And one of the things that the group did immediately on the day one when it hit America, when all these institutions closed, is just simply make a like a digest. Here are all the things you can do at home from all of the institutions we can find. And here's a way if you're an institution, you can submit something. And this one post has had, I think, something like 15,000 views, which is just people saying, I've got like three hours with my kids and I don't know what to do. And here's literally all the virtual museum visits in America right now, and there's 50 of them. And I can just pick a thing that's right for my kid. They're into space, they want to do something on the computer, and I want them to learn something. Like, kind of <laughs> click, go, and away you go. And so it's not just about doing the work for people who are coming to you, but about going to where people are. And there's some really nice, really simple things like the, the Philbrook Museum used to be called the Philbrook Museum of Art, but they've renamed themselves the Philbrook Museum of Staying at Home. And so just sort of acknowledging that it isn't the same as it was, but acknowledging where people are and saying, like, we want you to be here. We want to see you. You can't come here. We're also staying at home. We're in this together and not pretending it's not something that it is. I think those things are powerful. Um, but the, the one that I want to leave everyone with, and so hopefully, you know, take from these links what you will. Uh, Chris Unit, who's a, uh, kind of provides a service similar to what I do, but in the States, he, instead of producing more like his content, his content, his content, he just simply said, if institutions are going to do this, what questions should they be asking? And for me, I can I sort of think, think of it like a layer cake, a layer cake for institutions in this moment is, what can you do now so that you can protect yourself from the anxiety phase? The simple thing, the change of the, the home page, the change of the phone number, what are the things you can do so you're not anxious, so you feel like there's space to breathe? And then what are the strategic things you're doing that are just for the next couple of months, that are really till lockdown gets changed for your institution? Like plan for that, be thoughtful about it. How are you gonna roll it out? What will the messages be? Who needs protecting? Who in your staff are suddenly without work? Who needs to be supported? Do you all need to get paid the same? Do you all need to work the same hours? Like what are the things you're doing so that there's a kindness to your work and a kindness to the way you treat your staff and the way you treat your audiences? And then the third sort of part of layer cake is 
what is different for you for the future? What are you learning from this that you can change about the work you're going to do in the future? And I think some of the questions that Chris Unit poses are actually all about that future bit. What's the place that you want to use this moment to get to? And Jackie's point at the very beginning, I think, should like kind of echo through the hour and echo through the week and echo through the month is what are your values and how can you make these decisions that are based on how do you operationalize your values is a better way of thinking about it. So you take the values and turn them into actions that you make by strategic and tactical. For me, that's kind of the core of it, but it's obviously really different in every institution. But there are ways to do it that follow that kind of methodology that are right for you, that are right size and right scale and don't lead to burnout and don't lead to fear and don't lead to anxiety. Mm. Beautifully said, Kim. <laughs> can, I, can I jump in, Beck, or did you want to keep asking another question? Of course you can, please do. Um, I'm just going to do tactical and strategic because those two did cool. I don't have I don't have someone else to so I'm just gonna like try that <laughs> <laughs> also I'm not completely sure about the difference of the difference no. um, <laughs> stuff you should do um and stuff you should think about I think that's how you differentiate anyway whatever um yeah I totally agree with with both of those excellent people Lizzie and Kia um that idea that there's this um this need to respond now, that type of the tactical need. Um, and then there's that need to sort of think more deeply. And that's the kind of the reflective thing that artists are quite good at, actually. Um, it's just about allowing yourself to do it. And as Kia was speaking, I was just re really strongly reminded of how when people, when arts companies and artists sort of jumped online, and not just them, but like researchers and all sorts of people jumped online at the start of this lockdown period, just giving things away, just wanting mm. to be generous. And it, it's not necessarily, it's just, it's not even bad digital strategy. It was just this real impulse to give. And I think that that is a, a driving impulse of artists mm. um, and, and people, you know, people in general. We want to be able to connect. We want to be able to have a relationship. And we do that through through giving and receiving. Um, and so I think that impulse is, is really important and one to maintain going, going forward in whatever you do digitally. And whatever you do in general, you know, the gift of art always supersedes whatever it is that people pay for, pay for that art. Um, so to kind of, to acknowledge that impulse and and value that impulse as well, I think it is, is really valuable. Um, and by that, I also mean, don't necessarily try and monetize your digital activity, especially not in the next six months. <laughs> But beyond that, you can you can certainly think about that. There, there are ways to have digital content strategies which have financial value. You know, I'm not saying that there isn't. And that's something that I think Yen, my husband, will be talking about at one of your later um, salons. That's right. Um, yeah, so how, how you actually have a digital content strategy which which earns money is, is a different kind of thing to what I'm talking about, which is digital activity, which just keeps you um, it grounded in your practice and engaged with people right now. Um, yeah, in that very kind of gift relationship. Um, I do also want to say that if you're going to be doing digital activity, make sure you survey people. <laughs> I mean, I'm a researcher and these guys are researchers. You've got to ask, well, survey or just ask people about their experience of that, of the, of the digital, um, because it'd be so interesting to be able to, to know what they are getting out of it. I know Osco and Pattern Makers are doing some kind of more broad stuff, but it'd be just great at a company or an individual level to, to know what that stuff is about, how that's going. Mm. Can, can I? Lizzie. Oh, Lizzie, you go. I spoke a lot. <laughs> I just wanted to pick up on um, what Jackie was saying there about audiences, because I think that is a really, that is the other crucial part. So we've talked about value, we've talked about your own resources as an organisation, and I think the other crucial things you really think about is is your audience and um and to try and understand as deeply as you can what their experience is right now i guess the other part of that that kind of coming together of different sectors is the context as well which is you know the internet and mm -hmm. um that sounds kind of weird but um you know your organization its values and resources your audience where they're at right now and the internet which is itself a kind of quite site specific space for engagement um, and I think it's one of those moments where if people do try and recreate, as you know, Jackie was saying earlier, 
or I think Beck was saying earlier, if you try and recreate kind of gallery walkthroughs or try and recreate that physical space, you might be missing the site specificity of the internet, mm. which actually has very, very different qualities, more to do with interactivity, more to do with, um, uh, you know, being in your own home and the connection between your own home and other people, that kind of like lateral connection. Um, so I think that there's a lot that needs that people need to bring that thought around context and the empathy for what their audience is going through to, to their strategy. And I was thinking about research around audiences at this time because um, there's part of me that feels like there's never going to be a more documented, more kind of data rich time than this because every cultural interaction that people are kind of undergoing has some kind of digital trace because so much of it is being mediated through the internet. And um, at, the, at the salon on Friday, um, we're also having a presentation from the Art Gallery of New South Wales from Miranda Carroll, who is going to talk about some of the data that they're getting back from their kind of amazing program together in art. Um, because there is so many ways of tracking what your audience is doing. But I think, as Jackie says, all of that tracking, all of that data needs to be kind of triangulated with actual listening to audiences and to their experiences whether that's through kind of social media or other other formats right now but i also wanted to say that the one thing we, we mustn't forget um so we've got audiences they're not the only people involved in this the other people are your team and um as um we were talking earlier about what resources you have available i think people's teams are at this moment a really amazing resource and um just speaking of Miranda Carroll and the Art Gallery of New South Wales, if anyone has not looked at their um, Together in Art programme, I think it's a really great example of a big organisation, which is often quite anonymous when you, when you visit it in person, really using their people well to create that sense of connection and engagement. Because I've, been, I've visited that website lots now with my family. Um, everyone's developed kind of kind of a curiosity about particular curators who are posting things that now seem very much from the heart they're really understanding the context of the internet i think the art gallery and what mm. they're doing um, and i'll post the link in a minute to have a look at um, some of the work but for me it was this great combination of understanding that your audience is actually quite time poor i think there's this great myth that lockdown is this moment when you're going to listen to like all the symphonies that you've never listened to or like recategorize all of your books or something but people are actually trying to juggle working from home often with families with you know washing all of their shopping so it's actually not a it's not a leisurely time it's actually a quite high pressure moment and the art gallery's format has um, included these fantastic snappy short pieces they're calling them pocket exhibitions and I think they've got called micro wonders or something little film programs and all of those have been kind of delivered with very kind of fresh and personal voices from their curators and to me that's a really winning formula they're not kind of going for a huge highfalutin digital kind of you know all singing all dancing kind of program they're going for something that's personal that's quick that's got character and to me it's working really well yeah, and yeah, the National Museum of Australia. So, oh, sorry. The National Museum of Australia is doing a similar thing, collecting, you know, this moment as a national institution, but also doing a lot of um, museum at home posts where individual curators are talking about specific objects in a minute or less is the goal. And often it's not a minute or less. Usually it's ninety seconds or sometimes two minutes. But like the goal is to say something meaningful, personal about an object. Um, and I think that's quite powerful. And just to kind of echo and then amplify, the, the, the internet has a whole bunch of affordances that are different to the physical space of a cultural institution, whether that's a gallery, a library, museum, archive, an observatory, a, you know, an aquarium. My kids hate that we can't go to the aquarium. So everyone has different things, but you can do stuff that you can't do. So you can swim with a fish in a way that you couldn't in a real aquarium. You can um, see the artist studio next to the work, next to the artist, next to the curator in a way that you can't do in the real world. And so trying to recreate the real world online, I think is a sort of largely a failed enterprise. Um, it, it's a utility, but it's not expressive. It, I don't find it emotional. It doesn't, I, I don't find connection to it, even though I've built some and I don't, I'm not even connected to things I've made. Whereas if you can do something like Lizzie's describing where it's personal, it's connected, you can sample it and you can find a thing that's appropriate for you or your family or your, your children, then you can express your values, your excitement, you know, your energy, through the interface that people are acknowledging. Some of the best education, museum education content I've seen, like actually leans on the homeness and tells you 
go and find three of these sorts of things in your house and then we're going to do this thing with it and so you're like yes i do this in my house this is for me in my house ask someone what their favorite such and such is oh i can talk to my parents and ask them something it's going to help me you know do this little task treasure so that sort of stuff like acknowledge the affordances and lean into them and exploit them is super important sorry jackie i think we were looking at that um i I just wanted to like jump on that bandwagon totally. I totally agree with you guys that it's the personal that works online with um so one of the one of the arts companies we've been chatting to is in the performing arts, which has obviously been very hard hit. And it's a it's a small, it's a world, well, it's a medium sized, I guess, company. Um and we've been talking to them about how they can just really double down on their local artists at the moment, you know, the artists that they support in through their development programs. Um, and they're quite a diverse group as well. And just, you know, really encourage them to create like little videos, like um, one of them's a singer. So maybe she might want to do some like singing, you know, tutor not tutorials, but like choir type stuff. One of them is um, kind of physical performance. So they could, and, and they've also got a, uh, some disability artists who could do some quite and they're quite amusing um, videos on how to live during with self isolation. You know that kind of quirky humour sort of angle. Um, and they could also do these videos outdoors, like in that local environment, because it's a regional company as well. So you can use your online activity very much to to build that personal connection um, with the local artist and the local environment um, mm. yeah, i noticed that the bbc not the bbc sorry the british film archive has this thing where you can click on an interactive map and look at films from their archives that are about that local area and it was it's very popular this is from a, a while ago but it's actually very popular because people want to see stuff from their own like where they live <laughs> <laughs> um, so arts companies can tap into that as well. Could, could I, I think... argue against the, the, I feel like we're just furiously agreeing. So uh, we need to some tension. <laughs> so to inject some tension to make good content. Um, can I argue against the idea that we shouldn't be monetizing at all in this moment, or at least we shouldn't be thinking about it? Because I, I really feel, so members, are statistically significant, like a, like 50% or 80% more likely to renew in a year they're visited. So if a member doesn't visit, even if it, it's free, if they don't visit for a year, then the likelihood of them renewing is two or three percent, oh, twelve percent, let's say. And if they do visit, it's something like eighty percent. Like the difference is massive. And if you can't physically visit, so say you've got members expiring this month, next month, the month after, in order for them to resubscribe, which is like money for your organization, they need to have felt some connection, some form of visit for them to more likely to re-engage. I don't know what like the math is in the state, in Australia, but like I've did a lot of work on this in the States. And so it is, it, there is sort of straight um, remunerative value in creating what are human connections even if they're seen as free so I think if there's an argument internally well we don't want to do that digital stuff it's just money out the door time out the door and there's no return to us well if people are engaged then there is a return there's a return in higher pro propensity to renew I mean Colin Din Dylan Schneider has a whole bunch of graphs on this more likely to donate when they do view more likely to shop in the shops so, so there is a re there is a kind of financial or programmatic return from doing generous connective work during this period. Yeah. But like I just like it might be people might hear that as like, oh, we're just doing it because it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do and it will make you more money down mm -hmm. the road. And I'm just gonna post um, something that this that came out really recently, which was someone mm -hmm. followed uh, National Theatre at Home, which did a program where you could donate during and it, it had some famous actors in it. This is in the UK. And they simply took a screenshot every 30 seconds through the entire thing to see how many viewers, how many comments, how many donations, et cetera, et cetera. And it shows you, which I think is really interesting and definitely worth looking at if you're thinking about monetizing uh, performance content, uh, this is definitely worth a read. So this is like one of the great institutions in the, in the UK, um, spending a huge amount of money <laughs> and what they get back. So it's worth a read. I just want to talk about that particular piece of research though because the take-home mm -hmm. message from that piece of research was it was impossible for them to make anywhere near the amount of money 
releasing it online as they had done through their um, National Theatre Live programme, which went out to cinemas. So there was a really interesting mm. comparison in that bit of data that you showed there, Kia, that talked about how much it, it costs to make a high production values piece of theatre like that, how much the piece of theatre itself cost in the first place, huge, how much return mm. they'd got from their National Theatre Live programme, which is where you beam it to a cinema and mm. everyone still gets that collective feeling of being in a place and they've made millions back from that way and then a really paltry amount that they've managed to make by releasing it digitally um, so in a, in a funny way that data speaks to both of those points that um, you may monetize mm -hmm. but your monetization may be really slim and it's likely that you're going to have to think about new new monetization models as well but also the fact that maybe the best monetization kind of model at the moment or one of the options available is really around donation because you know and that's kind of goes back to what Jackie was saying about people feeling very givey at the moment um, and also very supportive to the services that are giving them some kind of quality of life um, and mm. also the idea that giving has become something that you can do in a quite small way in this kind of moment I know a lot of people will be paying you know their hairdresser or someone that they can't see but they rely on um, and and I, I just wanted to talk about this example of um, a kind of really fantastic example from England that I was extremely impressed by, um, uh, which is from Colchester in England. Um, I can't remember the name of the gallery at the moment. I think it's Sight Works. Anyway, I'll post the link up in a second and you'll have a little look. But um, they have this beautiful strategy, which is about giving away PDFs of activities for people to do. Um, and then once they've given away that PDF of activities, and these are by really top line artists, like Jeremy Deller is one of them, lots of Turner Prize winners there. Um, they then immediately straight on to have, you know, donate here so we can keep things like this free. And immediately, I think the, the feeling is if you can give, you want to give. And particularly because in that particular example, the reason they're giving away these PDFs for free is because they're very cognizant of the digital divide. And the fact that an awful lot of people don't have access to the kind of digital resources that we're talking about. So while we've kind of mapped up this domain of like organizational resources, who your audience are, what they're doing, what the internet affords, there's also this big question down there in kind of internet and audience that lots and lots of them do not have access to high bandwidth, don't have access to their own devices. I think it's a really huge kind of sleeping issue in this whole conversation that while organizations may be kind of working out what they can do digitally they really need to be bearing in mind that a huge part of the population don't have access to that kind of digital stuff so this particular gallery in england has said right we're going to make our digital content as simple as it can be we're going to make it black and white pdf it doesn't have to be done online which i think is also really important because as many of us know our children are spending way more time online and on screens than we would like so any activities that you can get and then take them away from the internet are brilliant. Um, so they've got downloadable PDFs and they've also got a place where you can say, if you know someone that needs this pack that doesn't have the internet, let us know and we'll post it to them. So they're actually using the internet to connect themselves back to their communities, but not relying on the internet for that connection. And I think that's a really important part of this whole story is that idea that there is digital inequality out there. And we really need to be thinking about that in the experiences we, we provide to people too. Mm. Now, I might. What I might do is see if we can open, uh, open up to our um, open up to the floor, as it were, open up to the sphere of others who have joined us. Um, Cara Lopez, I believe, is online and is uh, and works with um, Kazula Powerhouse and is happy to kind of talk about their approach to their digital strategy. Cara, are you still there? Do you want to? Do you want to? Um, join us? Yep, I'm still here and um, it's really great to be able to finally um, develop um, a strategy for online. Um, I've been working um, at Kasula for um, the past few years since Craig Donarski, our director, started and um, it's been a while since we've been mulling over the best way to engage with our audiences um, because Kasula itself isn't um, as easy to get to, even though theoretically we have um, a train station at our doorstep. And I guess um, having this um, circumstance that forced us to um, be more creative with getting to our audiences was great. So 
um, it took a little bit of um, thinking within the team of the best way we can utilize everybody. And it just so happened that um, a lot of people had interest in developing and editing videos. And also at the same time, um, our public programs team have been um, slowly trying to get activities that people could very easily do at home because our um, workshops for school holidays and school term had been canceled. So this was a great way for us to find a way to utilize our resources in-house at the same time trying to reach audiences um, across the sphere. But at the same time, we're also developing physical packs for um, the seniors in the community who are unable to access things online because um, a lot of the um, nursing homes and aged care facilities in our um, local government area don't have the same kind of digital access that a lot of households might have. Mm. I also I had, a, I had a conversation with Craig actually last week um, where he was talking about that you're actually building sets for your um, digital content. So you're also working with, uh, work, still working in the, in the workshop and constructing things. Yeah, definitely. And our tech team have been integral in making this happen because they not only have the technical know-how of how to operate the lights and the sounds in our theater, but it was also a way for us to um, engage with the proper social distancing that's required for people who are still required to go into the workplace. So it's a collaborative effort that I think is bearing a lot of fruit. Yeah, and Lizzie just uh, made the point in the comments about, um, I guess, Kazula's engagement with um, the elderly um, community, and particularly because <laughs> they're so um, uh, immunocompromised and, and all of those things that even um, uh, relatives can't visit. Mm -hmm. um, so how, is, how have those programs been received, Cara? Um, at the moment, like what we've done is we've built um, the packs and delivered them to the um, aged care facility so that there would be very minimal contact between um, our staff and theirs. And we've started small. So I believe there's about 140 packs that were created. And um, based on the success of that, they're going. our team has been asking um, those care centers how um, the elderly have received it and how how they are enjoying it. And then from there, we'll develop the packs um, to suit their needs, from what I understand. Mm. Mm. That's great. Um, is, there, is, there, is there anyone else in the, um, in the audience sphere that would like to talk to the programming that they're doing or have any questions for Jackie and Lizzie and Kia? You can unmute your mic or you can um, uh, put a question in the comments. It can be strategic or tactical. <laughs> or stra stratactical, as I like to call it. Stratactical. Stratactical. <laughs> some quiet moments in these in these things. Kia, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to like throw in another resource that I've found really helpful. So if if you're yourself sort of in charge with this shift to digital, this pivot, this whatever the language is, or um, your staff or a colleague is, um, there's a, the, the Museum Computer Network is a kind of broad international, largely North American, a group of museum professionals, sort of all volunteer run. Um, it's just about sort of capacity uplift and using technology in the museum space and museums writ large. Um, and there's been, um, I'm on the board, so I kind of see the stats and there's been a really big uptake of the special interest groups uh, of late. So people signing up for special interest groups to kind of like to like, attach themselves to the hive mind of people who've been doing this for a long time who are suddenly having to do this. Um, so it's, um, I can post a link, but if, if people are interested, there are kind of communities like the one that Lizzie and I are uh, helping develop here in Sydney. There are kind of purely online communities. Uh, there's certainly things like hashtag museum at home uh, or museum from home that are happening on sort of Twitter and Instagram, to, which are great sort of inspiration and, and sort of cannon fodder. Um, but there's, I guess what I'm saying is there are communities like 
creators developing those communities like you know working on those communities in different parts and um, so if you do feel alone there's it's understandable but there are hopefully places you can find your tribe and your collaborators and get kind of one-on-one -on -one thoughts or feedback where people can say well before you try that here's what we learned when we tried a similar thing um yeah yeah, there's a comment here from Brett Adlington, thanks Brett, um, which actually clarified the comment that you've made earlier, which was basically about um, maintaining your relevance um, while you're in lockdown and while the institutions are closed. It's sort of maintaining the relevance also for the institution that supports you, which in this case is the council, the local council, and making um, them aware of the kind of work that, um, and the meaning that I, I guess that, um, organisation has for, for its community um, in these times and especially as they're imagining seeing budget cuts in their future. Exactly, that's exactly the kind of thing that kind of got us going Brett in the first place, that's what, so we were kind of talking and thinking about public value anyway but it really crystallised when um, an organisation that gets a lot of its funding from a local council um, sort of started talking we were, we were talking to them and they were talking to us about what they should be doing and we were very much saying well you need to prove your public value that's what you need to do over the next sort of six months um, you need to make sure that after, like when things reopen the public is on your side mm -hmm. and public sentiment is not just kind of lukewarm in your favor but actively in your favor so that council sees your relevance um, so that's why we were we were really suggesting that they do things like um, focus on the local artists that they're supporting through their development programs and get those artists to create just the short kind of person, individual focused kind of content that Lizzie was talking about that seems to work on the internet um, and in, in the local area as well. So physically it, it's it's locatable. You can see that it's, that it's from that local area. Um, and it, it's really, it's good for the well-being as well of that local community. Um, and then council can mm -hmm. see that public sentiment is on your side and public sentiment actually is on your side because <laughs> you've, mm -hmm. you've remained relevant to people during this period. So that's that was the context we were, this all kind of came up for us in. It was a local regional council funded performing arts type of organisation. Yeah, because mm. performing arts, it's, um, you know, it's going to be pretty hard for a while. Yeah. Um, there's another comment from Overton Creative. Um, they say that the festival board is weighing up doing a digital music performance. Will it support the brand? Will it cut through during this time? And that the, the discussion is very useful. And I guess it's that, that sort of example of the National Theatre doing um, the online and the costs versus um, staying present. Um, those are things that are, ca are kind of part of a risk assessment, I guess, that Overton are looking at doing now. Uh, and those are really important points for um, organizations to think about. Yeah, um, with that and I think that point about will it get cut through. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Just that point about whether it will get cut through is a really important one because. It is weird um, to say it, but there's quite a saturated market out there now in terms of digital content. Like there is a lot happening. So um, kind of trying to understand or work out what you can do that is different from what everybody else is doing. And I think that really goes back to Jackie's point at the very start of this, like the way to be able to work out if what you're gonna do gets cut through is if it is true to the unique values that have made your organization successful up till now. Um, this um, is a really interesting, oh sorry, carry on, oh, sorry. Uh, just also in response to that before you get to the next question, um, the festival board weighing up doing digital music performances. So yeah, as Lizzie said, it's it's a really saturated digital market. So we, we're really encouraging companies to look at what they do well, what their niche is and what their local, what their local angle is. So if you're the National Theatre of the UK, you can get like lots of people watching your your play but very few other people can so you really just have to double down on what your value values are what your local kind of niche strength is and and just and go to those people don't try and get thousands of people to see you just get the 300 people who love you to see what you're doing and to continue to feel engaged and their friends and their friends you know what i mean mm. yeah 
Um, so this is a really interesting question. Um, I guess a lot of organisations um, have volunteer support staff. Um, and a lot of those uh, volunteer support staff are elderly um, and might not be as technically savvy um, as the young'uns. Um, do any of you, um, Keir, Lizzie and Jackie, have, a, have any uh, tips about this? Telephone. <laughs> Don't forget the telephone, people. Like, you know, the older people, the older generation love to talk on the phone. And a lot of them still have that really old fashioned thing, like a phone line connected to the place that they live, like a locationally <laughs> specific phone. Um, and I feel like it's the time for those phones to come back into, into use. So if you're really dealing with people who are not at all tech savvy, but you want to keep in touch with, so perhaps you've got a particularly elderly cohort, maybe they're involved in a seniors art kind of, you know, um, group. And I know there's a lot of groups also dealing with people with dementia and other things like that. The telephone is a really great way to do that. And I've been watching my 81 year old mother keep in touch with her bridge group and keep in touch with VA all by phone. So it's worth remembering that's that's a technology that we have. And actually a lot of these, so Skype, we use Skype here at Create New South Wales, and you can actually do that sort of Skype and bring the phone into the Skype. So you can actually call, use that tool, get your staff that are online online and then you can actually ring and invite um, others through the through their telephone numbers even landlines. Kia? Uh, my wife uh, works for TAFE and does a lot of work with people with low English literacy and low technical uh, technology literacy and so and their pivot they like pivot to digital she's been sending packs like printed packs to um, sort of like uh, challenged learners and then calling them and talking them through what's expected of them with that pack. Uh, so like, yes and the telephone um, and yes and this idea of being able to print and uh, acknowledge that not everyone can, maybe maybe they have the internet or they have like a an old uh, Samsung smartphone that a, that a nephew or niece gave them, but that doesn't give them capacity that doesn't give them capability, that it doesn't give them agency, it just gives them access. So there's not it's mm -hmm. not only just access or not access, it's access and it's graded within that. So acknowledging if you have a, a not technically, uh, you know, technical uh, savvy volunteers, but you want them to stay engaged because you want them to volunteer when they can three months from now, what can you send them and how can you talk to them to give them agency? Oh, here oh, we have yeah, the wonderful... Yeah, uh, regional uh, gallery. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful Rachel PSC. Hi Rachel. Um, Hi Rachel. Uh, they're doing uh, regular phone calls to their volunteers and keeping them engaged and supported. Your volunteers are the best. I just want to say so that. Cool. Yeah, right on. <laughs> As always, ahead of the curve. <laughs> um, yes, we know they are Rachel. They're incredible. Um, so I uh, I know that people are starting to lead the conversation a little bit now. Um, so I just do want to take this opportunity to thank um, Keir and Lizzie and Jackie for joining us for our very first Create Connects. I think we've had some really um, interesting conversation today, a lot of things to um, think about. Um, uh, thank you all. It's been one pleasure to have you uh, on this platform. Um, I, I did want to back. say that... Oh, it's my pleasure. I did want to say that um, Create New South Wales um, were able to um, announce a range of new um, programs um, in light of um, COVID-19 uh, just on Friday and uh, we invite you to take a look at them. We've got a little slide up which shows you uh, where to navigate to. Um, there are a range of new um, initiatives. Some of them are about digitizing I need to digitize my brain um, and uh, others uh, are engaging with um, health and well-being and uh, the future uh, of regional some regional programming after COVID-19 and we have also increased uh, by basically 100% the pot of money that was available for small 
project grants and those are all for um, individual artists so we um, do invite you to take a look at those. And every week we'll be having um, more of these Create Connects uh, webinars and our New South Wales Abrog Aboriginal Arts and Culture webinar series will also be happening. Um, so I just want to thank you all. D uh, Data Salon is um, on Friday for those of you interested in what Keir and Lizzie are doing. Um, and yeah, I'd like to say a massive thank you to everyone um, uh, in your various homes and places of work now. <laughs> you can invite your children back into the room. Um, yeah, so we'll leave this up for a little bit so you can have you can have a look at uh, all of the links and things that um, Keir and Lizzie and Jackie have popped into that chat box. But thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.